Hello and welcome to the webinar, The Sequential Intercept Model, How to Assess Opportunities for Early Intervention. My name is Mary Ann Dyer, Adult Redeploy Illinois Program Director at the Illinois Criminal Justice Information Authority. This webinar is part of the Illinois Data-Driven Health and Justice Project. Illinois has joined a national initiative to find ways to use data and share information across systems to better identify and address the needs of people with complex behavioral health issues who cycle through emergency departments and jails. These individuals are sometimes referred to as super utilizers. The purpose of these webinars is to provide a foundation of knowledge about super utilizers to facilitate productive conversations about how to intervene earlier for more positive and less costly results. This particular webinar features the Sequential Intercept Model, a tool with which health and justice system stakeholders can determine where such opportunities for early intervention exist in the community. Our agenda today will go through the learning objectives, then have an overview of the Sequential Intercept Model, and hear from a local jurisdiction, Champaign County, about an example of a mapping ex exercise in their community. By the end of this webinar, you will learn what the sequential intercept model is and how it is used in community mapping exercises. You will recognize the value of focusing on early intercepts zero and one for maximum impact. And you will understand the usefulness of the sequential intercept model in cross-sector conversations about super utilizers. Our presenters are Michelle Rock, Executive Director of the Illinois Center of Excellence for Behavioral Health and Justice, and Alan Jones, Chief Deputy at the Champaign County Sheriff's Office. Michelle will give an overview of the Sequential Intercept Model, and Alan will talk about Champaign's experience with the local Sequential Intercept Mapping exercise. Michelle? Thank you, Marianne. So today, um, I'm going to give a brief overview of the sequential intercept model and um, a brief explanation of what mapping for the sequential intercept model will look like. Um, I know most of you probably would agree that uh, we have an overrepresentation of persons with mental illness and substance use disorders within our jails and prisons, and that persons with mental illness and substance use disorders stay in jail longer before their disposition. And also that we currently do not have all the appropriate interventions for persons with mental illness and substance use disorders in our community. And so um, the goal for me today is to give you that overview of the sequential intercept model, which is um, a mechanism, an organization tool um, to look at these issues, identify evidence-based creative solutions, and explain what a sequential intercept mapping would look like. So before we are able to um, really talk about sequential intercepts, I really want to do talk about the program, the problem really quickly. Um, we have an expanding population under correctional supervision within our country. Um, it has grown um, exponentially over the past 15, 30 years. Um, not only the people in jail, prison, but those also on parole and probation. We also have a, num a rising number of people in our prisons and jails um, who are there for drug offenses. And many of those people are there on drug offenses um, that are status violations, nonviolent offenses, um, but simply because they, they were using. We also have a significant amount of our population in custody um, with a serious mental illness. So if you look at the screen, uh, you look at the general population just out in, the, in our communities, only about 5% of our population has a serious mental illness. However, when you go and look at the jail population, you have at least 17% that has a serious mental illness, which is a significant overrepresentation of persons with a serious mental illness within our jails. But then if you look at that 17% in our jails, we have a significant amount that also have a co-occurring substance use disorder, 72%. Um, these statistics were, were done in 2006 and have not dramatically changed since then. Also significant to think about is this population also has a significant amount of trauma that they have experienced. 
And so we want to keep in mind that when we're looking and talking about uh, either sequential intercept model and mapping, or whether we're just looking at this person, this population in general, that we do need to keep in, in mind um, the issues of trauma as they relate to the population. So this just summarizes um, uh, what you're seeing, uh, looking at the high rates of people with serious mental illness um, in our jails and those with substance abuse uh, disorders. And the fact that they spend a lot longer in our jails and prisons, figuring out ways to work with them and collaborate affect the issue. We also know that there's been serious cuts not only to, um, not only in the lack of having a state budget, but we know that over the years that we've had significant cuts to behavioral health services, which has impacted our ability to work with persons with uh, behavioral health disorders. And in doing so, um, we find more and more people that are now um, placed in jail and prison because of those lack of resources. So that gets us to the sequential intercept model, understanding the problem that we're faced with and as a community, how we have to better work and be more creative with the solutions that we have for working with persons with behavioral health disorders. Um, the sequential intercept model was developed and is used as, a, as, as an organizing tool. It's a conceptual framework for communities to consider the interface between the criminal justice system and behavioral health systems and how those two can have communication and collaboration to work better together to have better solutions and how we can divert people from our criminal justice system um, before they get it too far embedded within it. Um, this, we talk about the facilitation of the cross-system communication and collaboration, how we need to identify underused resources, improving early identification of people with mental illness and substance use disorders that come in contact with the criminal justice system, how we can increase effective service linkages reducing the likelihood of persons recycling through our criminal justice system when they receive the appropriate services that they need, how we can enhance community safety, and improving the quality of life for people within our community. So we know that we're faced with multiple problems and multiple systems. So how do we bring those issues together for, and look at a need for a more effective strategy um, to bring those systems, how we, how we combine and collaborate those complex systems and those context, complex problems to then come up with some really good solutions. And that we have to recognize that this is really a community problem. This is not one system being responsible for it, that we come together and as coming together, we are stronger and have better solutions um, as we go forward. So the sequential intercept model was developed um, by Mark Lunas and Patty Griffin and Hank Stedman and through um, efforts um, of SAMHSA and Policy Research Associates. And it originally started with a concept of a funnel. How can we get people at the front end of our criminal justice system and make it funnel into a better um, way? How do we divert people at the beginning and the front end of our system with behavioral health issues? And it originally started with just mental health. Um, that behavioral health has um, come in both mental health and substance abuse and looking at this, this, these issues. Um, and, and so really started looking at this funnel of how we can divert people from the criminal justice system. The sequential intercept model. Um, key that we really look at a couple things here. Sequential, because we really want to look at how people move through our criminal justice system in very predictable ways and an intercept, um, we have key points where we can intercept to ensure that we have better ways to work with people. Um, and this envisions a series of points or intercepts where we can then intervene and make better decisions and keep people from getting deeper into the criminal justice system. As you can see, those key points or intercepts to ensure prompt access to treatment, opportunities for diversion, timely movement through the criminal justice system, and making sure that we have the appropriate linkages to community resources. So when this was developed, there were five key points of intercept, interception um, that are listed here. Law enforcement emergency services, booking and initial court hearings, jails and courts, reentry, and community corrections and community support. And this is what the sequential intercept model looks like, um, which I want you to know that you can go online and there's valuable resources and, and handouts that you can get 
we go into sequential intercept model as well. We want you to use this as a, as a tool, as an organizing tool that identifies, makes you um, look at how you can see the bigger picture and how things fit together, and then use this so that your community can develop strategies, targeted strategies, um, to then increase diversion and community linkage for persons with behavioral health disorders. Something interesting that has happened um, from the time that the sequential intercept model was first envisioned and through some mapping inter, um, exercises that communities have done around the, co the country, uh, something has been developed. As I first showed you, there was only intercept one through five. Intercept zero has truly become um, probably one of the larger intercepts that we really want to focus on as communities. Um, communities have seen this where we can find um, better um, through mapping exercises, we've decided that we want more comprehensive community services and supports to keep people from ever entering the criminal justice system. So if we develop those things that people need with behavioral health disorders in Intercept Zero and have those in our community, we may be able to um, reduce or completely keep people from entering the criminal justice system. We can dramatically decrease those um, if we focus on intercept zero. And so intercept zero really focuses on those community solutions and community interventions that we have, making sure that we have appropriate um, treatment for behavioral health, for mental health and substance abuse. So we have to make sure that we have these things available within our communities to make sure that people um, have a, the best chance possible from not entering our criminal justice system looking at our behavioral health services, making sure that we have appropriate mental health, substance abuse, trauma, domestic violence, medications, um, both inpatient and outpatient services for people, individualized treatment plans, making sure that there's um, group and individual services and that we're sensitive to those needs within our community, making sure that we have bilingual, gender specific and integrated treatments available and the psychiatric care that they need. We also can't just focus on those things. What else do people need within our community and making sure that we have housing that is available, not only emergency shelters and transitional houses, recovery homes, but also permanent supportive housing um, that people can become stable in so they can truly focus on the issues and the behavioral health needs that they have. Making sure they have transportation, um, access to medical care. We know that medical care is crucial uh, to this as well. Uh, integrated behavioral health within the healthcare setting, crisis lines, food pantries, access to child care and funding. We know that if these crucial needs are not met, it's very difficult to focus on behavioral health services um, and the treatments that we need to, to get better. So these are really some of the intercept um, uh, interventions that we need to see at intercept zero. Some of the evidence-based practices that fall within this intercept, really making sure that we have integrated treatment, um, not only um, behavioral health with the substance abuse and mental health through the integrated dis dual disorder treatment, but also making sure that we have integrated treatment with medical care uh, and, and making sure that uh, the whole person is being treated. Making sure that within um, these, that we have cognitive behavioral therapies, um, because we know Evidence has show, shown us that we need these as well um, to make someone whole and really change the behavior. Dialectical behavior therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, individualized placement services and assertive community treatment. Some of these things, as we know, because of um, behavioral health cuts, have, um, are very difficult to find. And as a community, we have to realize that these things are very important and that we want to make sure that they continue and how can we do that. So that gets us to our next intercept, intercept one, which focuses on law enforcement, which is through not only law enforcement, but also emergency responses. And, and looking at those things um, with, within our community where that intercept really occurs. So some of the interventions looking at intercept one, um, we have crisis intervention teams and making sure that police, this is a police-based approach um, which was developed in Memphis, Tennessee, that police officers are trained to intervene in mental health crisis, where there's the ability to recognize and respond better to someone with a mental health. And it's 
not only for the protection of the person with a mental illness, but it's also for the protection of the police and making sure that when they respond to someone in a mental health crisis, that they have the appropriate tools and training that they need to be safe. Um, that dispatchers are also trained, making sure that um, the communities understand that there are police officers that are uh, CIT trained so that they can be sent to a mental health crisis instead of um, someone who is not um, looking at communities and just making sure that we have the necessary training and resources for them. Um, looking at mental health first aid training, um, this is not as intensive as crisis intervention team training. We would call that you know, the gold standard, um, but it is a very intensive training. Um, is there something else that is also available to first responders with mental health aid, mental health first aid training? Making sure that all first responders have some sort of behavioral health training so they understand what substance abuse and mental health looks like, looks like, and some of the symptoms and ways to respond and to be safe for themselves and the person they're responding to. Mobile crisis teams are very effective teams. Um, some communities utilize these mobile crisis units. Um, these programs deliver a team of mental health professionals, the person in crisis situation, or a specified satellite location within the community. Um, these services are often limited in the capacity to manage the person um, who are violent or intoxicated, however, um, are, are very crucial. Also looking at um, triage, um, centers. Very important. Uh, we found in communities that have triage centers that it's a great diversion for persons with mental illness where police can look at it. They can talk to the triage center. It's a very quick response to drop someone off um, and they can stay there um, for usually up to 23 hours, stabilizing the person to see if they need further treatment or um, crisis beds, uh, crisis respite beds, which are the next one. Uh, where people can stay for up to two weeks normally and in looking at um, how to best stabilize. We know that when police routinely have to take someone to, and diverting them from jail, but taking to, them to hospitals and emergency rooms, a lot of times those psychiatric emergencies become lengthy and are difficult. And not only um, lengthy for the police to sit there with the individual in the emergency rooms, but also then uh, involuntary commitment laws have, have been very restrictive. And so these crisis beds in the triage centers give police a, a very good resource of where to um, focus and, and give people that opportunity to divert from our jails. Also making sure that we have the community services so officers understand what those are and making sure that they have the linkage, linkages and services um, to make sure people get connected to and then also having peer, peer support recovery. We know that uh, when people um, are able to talk to someone who has been through the same thing they're going through, um, chances of them uh, succeeding and, and staying with something uh, increase. And, and so those are all very important things. The overall goal with this Intercept One, we wanna make it easier, frankly easier, or at least as easy to refer someone into our treatment system as it is to put them into our jail and making sure that we um, give those resources to our law enforcement and our first responders is, is crucial. Intercept two, this really looks at the initial detention, the court hearings, and some things that we need to look at. Um, we need to make sure that we're using validated tools within our jails and within our pretrial probation uh, departments. Uh, to look at uh, ways to early identify people with mental illness, substance abuse, and veterans. Use of these, um, making sure that we have management information systems to clearly identify and link people to services. Looking at um, pre-diversion programs. Um, some state's attorney's offices um, will have some diversion programs right at the beginning to get people out of our jails into those programs uh, to, to be successful. Making sure we have immediate referrals, placing someone on pretrial service um, bond release and having them uh, follow up with those community services um, and making sure that we are following up and making sure that they have those connections. So all very valuable um, evidence-based uh, practices. Intercept three really looks at the jails and courts, really puts an emphasis on problem-solving courts or specialty courts like drug courts, mental health courts, veterans courts, 
um, and looking at ways that we can divert people from our jails. Intercept 3 um, looks at making decisions based on screening and assessments that we are looking and making objective decisions based on someone's um, mental health or substance abuse and looking at their entire situation that looks at their housing, their past treatments, and, and those strengths and weaknesses that they do have. Making sure that we, I keep going back to this, that service linkage um, and court coordination. Um, making sure that there's accountability tied in. One of the most successful things with problems out in courts is that there is that count court accountability piece for the um, offender, for the defendant. And not only then are they receiving the treatment, but there's court accountability that they're following through with it. And it's, it's another way to make sure that we um, can ensure that those get done. Making sure that we have jail-based services so if someone is in our jails, um, that we do make sure that we have the appropriate psychiatric services and medications. Making sure that they're getting screens that we can link them as they leave our jails. Um, and having additional services within there, making sure they're getting GED classes and NA or AA meetings and, and seeing that we can have those things. Um, the state of Illinois uses um, the level of service inventory revised or LSIR as a um, risk needs assessment and pretrial services um, or probation does those within our state. Uh, cross training, making sure that we have systems that look and understand what each other is doing and that we're cross trained. If we don't understand as a criminal justice system what mental illness and substance abuse look like, it's really going to be hard to identify and make sure that we have the people coming into our programs. We can have the best programs in the world, but if we can't identify and make sure they get into them, they're not being effective. And again, peer mentors, uh, same, same process as the peer recovery support specialist. Intercept 4 looks at reentry, so either pr prison or jail reentry. And we don't always look at jail as a reentry model, um, but making sure that we need to do that. Um, there's some wonderful um, programs around our state and country that, that look at um, intercepts and, and within this, these interventions within this intercept really looking at um, task reentry programs and Lutheran social service um, reentry programs, looking at what our linkages, who do we have in our jail that's ensuring that linkages are occurring as people get out. Don't wait until they're out, but work with them prior to making sure there's a transition or discharge plan and looking really at what needs that they have when they come back out of the community. Um, if we are just letting them go out, um, we are setting them up to fail potentially because we're not making sure that they're connected to the things that they're going to need to become successful, such as housing, employment, and transportation. Um, if we leave people um, without those possibilities, they're potentially um, set to continue the same behavior and without us linking them. Intercept 5 is really looking at community corrections, which is parole and probation in the state of Illinois. Um, and some of those very positive intercepts and interventions for Intercept 5 look at evidence-based practices, what we talked about within Intercept 0, making sure that we're really using cognitive behavioral therapies, um, moral recognition therapy, thinking for a change, making sure we're using motivational interviewing, getting people to understand that if we do things the same way over and over, um, that it's very difficult for us to make those changes. And I always try to say here, this is like me trying to be on a diet and thinking that I can continue to do the same things without making those changes. We do have to make those changes to really um, change our behavior and to, to effectuate long-term change. Making sure that we have um, people that are working with mental health and, and substances abuse offenders have reduced caseloads. Um, these are difficult populations. Um, making sure that all of these things are available to the offender while they are out, the person on probation or parole. And that there really has to be this strong collaboration between probation and treatment. It's absolutely crucial um, to make sure that they are communicating and making sure that um, they can receive the resources um, and, and be held accountable for the things that they need. So let's talk real quickly about sequential intercept mapping. Um, looking at the sequential, so looking at the entire sequential intercept model, how do we use that to then bring it into a community and map it? 
So one of the first things that we like to try and do is really explain what the sequential intercept model is, but then take each one of them and break them down within the community, making sure that we do a couple things. But first of all, we have to make sure that we bring the appropriate stakeholders within our community together for this exercise. And so examples. So this is looking at our treatment and um, our criminal justice system. So making sure that you have judges and lawyers, county board uh, representatives, probation, law enforcement, but then you have to also bring in the behavioral health treatment, mental health and substance abuse. You have to bring in other service agencies um, of what services that you can envision your clients needing. Examples, housing, food, transportation, employment, making sure all the people involved providing those services with your community are there for this community um, sequential intercept mapping meeting. Medical agencies, emergency rooms, and, and doctors within your community. And so once you can identify and bring those stakeholders together for this meeting, um, you want us to take time to seriously have a conversation. One of the most important things about collab collaboration is having the conversation. That's where you build um, trust and the ability to start working together much better. So what you're going to do is once you have everyone together, and have an understanding of what the sequential intercept model looks like, you're then going to assess what available resources you have. Um, for all of these different intercepts, you would write down what is available within each of those intercepts as diversion or services that can help someone within there. And then as crucial as well is then identifying the gaps in those services and resources that your community has. To look really at where the holes might be, and then that takes you down to then being able to have those discussions and collaboration, trying to coordinate. Um, there are, you will be surprised at how many times there are services available in your community that you don't know about. Then being able to better co coordinate those services, um, it not only saves time but also resources. It increases the communication and makes sure those services are being utilized to the highest capacity and functioning, and able to then train and work together. Um, developing then a group that's going to take this information forward. Some people call it a task force. Um, but really being able to action plan. Are there things on that list of gaps that you think may be low-lying fruit that you can um, easily accomplish? Are there some bigger items that are going to take some more planning? And making sure that you can then have this action plan and ensure that people assign people to do those jobs and to continue to meet um, regularly um, to make sure that you can um, accomplish those goals. Um, but making sure that you're also using um, evidence-based practices as you're going forward. You just don't want any service. You don't want any um, thing to, to just plug the hole. You want to make sure that it's um, been proven effective for the population you're going to be working with. Um, and I think it also gives you, in this tight economy and this tight budgets that we all face, ways to use our money much more creatively. When we share this vision and a direction that we have, um, we can then set budgets and, and, and goals um, appropriately. So we really want to focus that this is about systems. This is about um, not a single program, but it's about bringing everything together to make our entire community function well as a system for persons with behavioral health issues. We also want to really stress that this puts an emphasis on trying to get those diversions and those services as early as possible before people get truly embedded within our criminal justice system. And I cannot stress enough that um, not only do you need to do these things, but you need to figure out how you're going to use data. You're going to have to use data on the front end to identify the problems that you have, bringing this data to this community mapping meeting that you're going to have, looking at the number of people you have in your jails um, with um, and, and those on probation that have mental illness and substance abuse. So using the data that already exists, but then taking it forward, making sure that what you put together really addresses the accountability 
uh, making sure that you're able to reduce recidivism. And then you have to use that data to measure your success in addressing those problems. And what you planned on doing, was it effective? Did you um, effectively make decisions or are there things that need to be changed so that you can have better outcomes? So that's, in a nutshell, um, really looking at what uh, the sequential intercept and uh, sequential intercept mapping, the model and mapping, really look like. Um, I do want to say, just in closing, that if you have a community that wants to learn more about the sequential intercept model or wants to do a mapping exercise, please feel free to contact me at the Illinois Center of Excellence for Behavioral Health and Justice, and I know that contact information will be presented at the end of uh, the slideshow. Thank you. Alan? Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name's Alan. I'm with the uh, Champaign County Sheriff's Office here in Central Illinois. And uh, what I'm going to talk to you about is how you take as a law enforcement agency and uh, cooperate in this process because one of the things that I found out as a police officer on the street is that we would have contact with folks and never even really know what we could do to help them out. And so one of the processes that we uh, uh, can do as law enforcement agencies is to get with these providers who are really generally interested in helping us out and to have a, a quite a, a bit of experience and education and training to, to do so. So for us in Champaign County, we completed this exercise uh, in July of 2016. And to set the background just a little bit, a couple years ago when I was the jail administrator, I took a look at our familiar faces, our frequent utilizers, and the number of people that have been into the jail. And we looked at this as a number of five or more bookings in a single year. Well, in 2014, we had 47 people. 47 people that have been booked in five or more times, and so we checked with our local mental health and substance abuse providers and asked how many of these 47 people are already your clients, and they told us that about 68% of them, 31 or so, were already clients in the community of these providers, and so we started a process to try to figure out what we can do at the pre-described intercept zero and uh, the, the one intercept that we've been talking about, which is law enforcement. We in law enforcement want to try to find a way to keep from us having to be called. And so we did this in 2016, uh, July, with the Policy Research Associates. We're going to finish up the uh, two through five process with our own resources, and we'll talk a little bit about how we can make that happen. So as police officers, what we can do and what's done in this system mapping process is get with the folks at the local police agencies. Get with, uh, obviously, the sheriff's office. If you have a uh, connection there, they're going to give you the data as who's been arrested. You're going to know the names of these folks. Your dispatch center is well aware of these people. And in our case, this is the listing of the people that we brought together. There's a 24-7 behavioral health crisis line. We have a crisis response team that's provided in the community. You end up with some folks with the housing uh, and shelters for homeless. Don't ever forget about the Veterans Assistance Agency, the VA, if, if they're available in your community, as well as any peer support specialists. So this entire group came together, and we sat down and went through a prescribed process where you start identifying the different pieces of the puzzle. Now, as stated, Intercept Zero is the community, and as it's been stated by Dr. Stedman and them, we want to work with the idea that the people with the mental disorders don't penetrate the system at all. They don't come into the jail at all. You know, I tell this a lot of time. Police officers today have really three choices in most communities. Somebody's called to the house because somebody's experiencing a mental problem or a crisis and alarming the neighbor, and uh, you have three choices. The first is to say, sorry, there's nothing I can do for you. This is a mental problem, not a criminal problem. That doesn't go over too well because in law enforcement and most of our professions, we want to solve the problem and move on. Well, the next option is to take them to the hospital. Well, you folks in the hospitals all realize that's not necessarily the best option because you really have to deal with those that are suicidal, more harmful to themselves or to others. And the third option, which seems to be an over-relied upon option these days, is take them to the jail. And they charge them with disorderly conduct or some other type of event because we as police officers are solving the problem of the day in the most effective and efficient way but it creates this cycle of frequent utilizers that we see. Now, intercept one is what I just described to you, but 
if there's services available into the community so that the family members don't actually have to call the law enforcement agencies to call the 911, then they can reach out to a resource or reference center and somebody else can pick it up, help them with crisis management, case management, referral to medications and stabilizations and so on and so forth. So for us, our work on Intercept 1 is the question of what are we going to divert them to? Where are we going to take them as law enforcement officers? What are we going to do? So what we saw here locally in our process is that we have some gaps in services in the communication process. We, we know about the number of dispatchers we have, and we've identified those, but how many of them are actually aware of what they can divert people to or where they can send people to? We saw that we have effective Narcan training programs around here or are going to be put into place, but there was some inconsistent overdose prevention activities here in the community. These all take place by a series of questions and answers that we go through. What is available in the town? And those people that were at the table say, well, we have this and we have that. Michelle talked about it a minute ago. There's a lot of resources in our community, but sometimes when we as law enforcement officers, dispatchers, EMS, emergency rooms, whatever it may be, folks in the community, we don't even know what is truly available and where we can send somebody. So the important part for us in this process was gathering the resources that were there, sharing the information, and taking a look at what we can do. Well, our immediate response is that we can do, we have Narcan training, we have peer supports, and it's going to be continuing to grow. And there's, we want to continue to look for places for linking these folks to, to get some interventions before the police get involved. There's the opportunity to, in our area, especially here in Champaign, to drive to the east, to Danville, to get folks and the, the veterans connected at the VA administration over there in Danville. And the other idea, like I talked about with the 911 center, uh, we can get them to transfer folks to the crisis lines or hotlines or to services as opposed to recognizing or feeling the need to push that into a law enforcement response. All right, so one of the things that we did as we went through this, we started to realize who wasn't at the table or what hasn't been taken care of. So we recognized we needed the public health district to involve because they have programs and resources that are available. Youth mental health first aid training. Now, again, uh, Michelle talked about the mental health first aid training, and quite frankly, uh, as it looks at it, you talk about the CIT, one of the philosophies that I have as a law enforcement administrator is that not every officer or deputy is going to want to be a CIT officer. Forty hours of training, significant training, but applying it's another thing. These mental health first aid programs give them the introduction to what they could be seeing, what they need to recognize, and then gives them the resources that they could say, well, I need to have a CIT officer here or some sort of crisis officer or provider here, and it gets them an introduction to that. The other options are defined resources for peer support. There's some training certificates and certifications that go on. We rely here locally on the NAMI uh, group to help us with that. And we, we've identified that some future issues for us are detox capacity, uh, here in Champaign County in particular because we don't quite have a good response for patients who are merely intoxicated. And again, we're not talking about violence. We're not talking about matters where somebody is uh, out, we're going to be a danger to themselves or others. We're talking about the general nonviolent property trespass or other disorder type events that put us in this situation. I got that going too far ahead. One of the things that we found in Champaign County is that the police officers have set up a process with the CIT training, and they get to the point where they arrest, and they take them to jail, they're not prosecuted, and they're released sometimes even before the police will get out of the jail, out of their process. And so we want the CIT officers to start a process of creating an inventory of what's available to. And again, the, the focus that we've had here has been how do we identify where we can go with this? And bringing the hospital and bringing the emergency room staff and the, the, the ambulance staff, all of those folks to the conversation helped open that awareness. But the vacuum has to be filled with the information and then you start a process of 
of sharing that information, and that's what this is all about. You're establishing some ideas, some visions, and and how you can get there. And it's uh, you know, for those of you in law enforcement that may be here today uh, listening in, if you reach out to your local mental health board, 708 board, or to the folks at your local community mental health provider and say, we'd like to hook up and see about getting some training or share information, how can we help? You may, in law enforcement, have the key to what they need, and that's going to be the data that Michelle talked about. And this goes to the collaboration that was also accentuated earlier in the time. The data is to how many times the people get arrested. You know, I told you that in 2014 there were 47 that had been arrested five or more times. And again, arrested and gone to jail five or more times is a significant number, and that's in Champaign County. Our 2015 number went down to 40. But when you had those numbers, for example, the 47 in 2014, I gave that set of numbers to local emergency rooms. We have two hospitals here in Urbana. And what it turned out to be about 55 to 58% of those folks on my list had also been admissions to the emergency departments at both places. So you see now how the frequent utilizer and the the strain on our resource becomes an important aspect for what we have to do at the front end, zero and one intercepts and building the capacity out in that process. How do you do these exercises is probably something a lot of people are going to look at. To be honest with you, as a police officer, I had no idea that this type of process existed. Getting training from Michelle and, and others uh, that provide it, talking about the intercept mapping, it kind of made sense to break it down as to what can be done. And obviously Michelle said she would be glad to hook up with you, hook up with her group, and they'll be glad to help with that. And, and you can reach out to me at a later time. We can talk about the police side of the response. But more importantly, you have to have somebody in your community that's going to be the spearhead for this, this conversation. Who's going to have the ability to set the folks down and do this? And here in Champaign County, the reason we got to this point was because we have a good relationship with our mental health board, 708 board. And those folks were able to then help us as a sheriff's office create the additional contacts that allowed us to build these interactions in the community so that we could sit down those interactions with public health, with uh, our local mental health and substance abuse providers. We even have a relationship with a, a health care advocacy group who will assist in the process of getting folks enrolled in Affordable Health Care Act, um, affordable health care, so that they can also then have the ability to refer themselves out to some uh, different services that are made available. So in 2015, we ended up with 40, as I said. 2016, I'm looking at the numbers, and at a five or more process, we're going to be pushing that number again closely. What's interesting to us is we found that the names are changing. Some folks we get services and refer, and others will fill their place. But the data hasn't been able, we haven't been able to study the data to say, why are the names dropping off? Have some got what they've needed in the community, such as housing, and they're able to, to uh, stabilize? Or others, have they committed other crimes and moved on? Have they gone to family elsewhere? We're still in the process of trying to figure that out, and that's what our involvement is in the process and what we're looking forward to doing here in Champaign County. So for it was very painless, and it was something I encourage you all to to do as you form your collaborations and your partnerships and, and look to see what can be done in the process. So I've gone through this pretty quickly, but I think I'm going to leave some time for uh, Mary Ann and, and Michelle and us to, to uh, answer some questions if we start getting any. So um, now we have a few minutes for questions, as Alan said, uh, for those who are logged into the webinar. And you can just type them into the chat bar at the right of your screen. Um, I will uh, make sure that I uh, verbalize them and we'll get answers from our panelists. In addition, um, anybody can feel free to contact Michelle or Alan directly. And their contact information is included uh, here in the webinar. We also have uh, a reminder 
for our data-driven health and justice conference that's scheduled for Friday, December 9th in Champaign County. Um, and for further information on the initiative or on the data-driven um, health and justice project here in Illinois, please go to our website. Um, and here's the website address, www.icjia.state.il.us uh, backslash ddhj. So I hear that um, here on the uh, chat question we have, we've spoken with Michelle uh, from the Center of Excellence about the SIM mapping process before. How do we begin this process? Michelle? Um, yes, I saw that question. Um, we just need to uh, set up, well, first of all, we need to talk about stakeholders and who's going to drive bringing your community together. And then we would just need to set up um, we could work, the Center of Excellence can work with you to um, set up times to bring the community together to have those conversations. Michelle, can you, I'm sorry, can you talk about cost of putting together one of these mapping exercises, particularly as it relates to the Center of Excellence um, expertise, and perhaps the length of time it would take to uh, go through maybe each intercept? So one of the things, um, the Center of Excellence is a grant-funded um, organization, and we provide our training, um, free training and technical assistance. Uh, we do ask that the um, sites that we go to provide um, a place for us uh, to do the training that's appropriate and um, address any copying issues and uh, food issues. Um, those are things that are not necessarily covered by our grant, uh, but our, our ability to come is free of charge. Um, the, um, you know, I would recommend, frankly, an entire day if possible. Um, I think that you need to spend a little bit of time really understanding what a sequential intercept model looks like. Um, and you don't want to stop the conversations that you're going to have um, when you start talking about the resources and gaps that you have at each of the different intercepts. Um, so I, I would suggest at least a whole day, and then you need to plan um, follow-up meetings of making sure that the work continues, that, you, that you, the action plan that you set out. Um, Alan, I don't know how long you spent on intercepts zero and one. And, and I want to add to that is we spent a couple hours in an integrated process where there were a series of questions that were gone through. And essentially, you, you sit in a room together, There's uh, you, you ask questions, and you're going to be focusing on things like, uh, the dispatch center, the police agencies, what resources are, and everybody kind of says, well, we have 54 deputies, and of our 54 deputies, all of them have Narcan, all of them carry with them, all of them have CIT training, or only half of them, and, and so on and so forth. And the process that takes place is a, a large uh, aha moment, I think, for a lot of people. Now, getting the folks together um, in your community, as Michelle said, you're going to need a champion. You're also going to want to have somebody from your law enforcement community involved in that process. That's where I'm willing to help out because a lot of times cop to cop can help you if it's necessary. Uh, for the law enforcement folks on here, I would encourage you then to start the, the, the conversation if you're interested in doing this because having you come to the table when, uh, especially having law enforcement come to the table, and sometimes they don't realize what's available to us and how, uh, what great benefit these processes can bring to us. And, and I just want to add to, for the stakeholder piece, um, if you're going to do the entire sequential intercept model, um, law, judges need to be involved. We know that judges usually get people to show up at a meeting, so that's helpful. The other thing that I think is really helpful is the funding source. So if you have a 708 board or you have um, an active um, organization in town that can bring people together um, and they do provide funding, um, that's always an impetus for people to show up as well. Um, and if you can figure out someone to sponsor free food, that always helps as well. But, you know, figuring out who that champion is going to be is really important. So we're talking about kind of costs and the tight environment we're in. I would like to just um, see Alan and Michelle if there's anything that um, you can uh, provide in terms of how this mapping exercise or the efforts beyond that can most effectively take place in a budget neutral or um, cost cutting environment. 
Well, I, I would start off just by saying that I, I think what Ellen and I have expressed is you will be shocked at how much you don't know exists in your community. So I think there are more resources than you already know about, and trying to coordinate them doesn't cost anything. It's just your time. So there's no additional cost to that, making sure that the right people know that your resources exist and your services exist. Um, from there, I try to encourage people to look at um, things that are free or very cost effective. But one of the things that we have to keep in mind, if you have these super utilizers that are using significant time for your emergency rooms, your first responders, your police, and the time that they are spending in our, our jails, that it's a huge cost. And if we can take that concept and then look at diverting that cost and cost shifting to the appropriate services this person needs to keep them out of those systems, you're going to save money and you're going to get better outcomes and you're gonna improve quality of life for people in your community. And, and so I think that we really have to think differently about, we're, about, about what we're doing and have an open mind about doing things differently. Yeah, and, and I would add that I look at it this way, when you hold these types of meetings you know, and, and people are willing to come, they're, they're obviously they're getting paid, so there's a cost to the personnel, but the recognition of the importance of the work that's being done behind it. So when you have somebody champion this meeting and they agree to sit down and they talk, and you can talk about all these different things. It's important to come out with an action item, if you will, of an identification of how we might do it. And as Michelle just mentioned, with the, the cost that we have because of the frequent utilizers, let me throw a what if out there. What if the law enforcement agency, the sheriff's office, gave you the list of their most frequently booked in or a police department gave you the list of their most frequently contacted and a behavioral health uh, organization in the community realizes they're already a client of theirs and they say, hey, next time they're in jail, can we come and meet with them then because they're not engaging? What was the cost in that whole process? Probably not very much at all because it's already in place. So using these types of solutions, uh, being creative or um, you know, utilizing the, the caseloads that the folks already have can be done with probation as well. They're, they're at a different point in the intercept, but when you're talking about the front end, uh, having that ability to, to keep people from going to jail, that's a significant value to us. And, and I would add one thing, too, is that when you are collecting this data, you have to put a cost value to the services that you're giving. So um, I know one county did this, looked at their super utilizers, and the top 10 super utilizers were using several million dollars every year in services to first responders just first responders um, and, and emergency room care. Um, and, and so if you think about using that pot of money to divert those people, you, you already have a very good conversation to start with. So um, Michelle, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about uh, different ways that the sequential intercept model um, has been modified for use in different settings or a variety of uh, planning contexts. So the, the sequential intercept model was originally um, started to look at persons with mental illness entering the criminal justice system and how they move through it and trying to divert those persons. It expanded to behavioral health to include substance abuse. But I, I think it's something that we need to look at. Um, looking at the whole person that's coming in, um, we need to be looking at trauma and we can be looking at how veterans come into the system. You could use it for just about any type of thing, but I think that we really need to keep in mind that the ultimate focus of trying to get whatever population we're looking at, the appropriate services to keep them out of the criminal justice system or get them out as quickly as possible. So I think you could apply to different things uh, with that framework. And um, I, let me follow up with uh, one other question is, how often do you think a sequential intercept model mapping exercise should take place in terms of, or given that there are changing circumstances and changing system players in a local jurisdiction? Um, we know that our elected officials and leaders within our communities and counties change frequently. Um, I think that you definitely need to um, start off by having one. I think that you need to continue with those meetings um, 
frequently uh, to keep the conversations going. If those conversations are going well and you have the appropriate people that keep coming in, you may not have to do the full mapping exercise it um, as frequently. Um, but if those things change and you don't have the new um, stakeholders participating the way they should be, you may need to do a mapping again. Um, but every probably couple of years, it's probably good just to have a refresher. I would kind of look at it maybe like a strategic plan for your organization. Every so many years, you just kind of need to retool and make sure that you're still doing the things that you need to be doing and are being effective. Well, thank you very much. Um, I appreciate both of you providing expertise. And I believe, um, Alan, you've provided a lot of um, information um, is related to uh, the people who need to be around the table um, and some of the surprising findings you found. Uh, but can you talk a little bit more about um, having the healthcare entities at the table or the hospitals? You, you mentioned that briefly. I, I did. And to be honest with you, when you get into this process, I think, let me speak as a law enforcement officer, I got into this process with a little bit of frustration. And it's not surprising. I mean, you've got to follow the laws, but Illinois has some significant data confidentiality uh, laws in regards to privacy and so on beyond what's known as HIPAA. So the way we've engaged the local hospitals, and it's important to have them there, is that they actually participate in what we have, we call a crisis intervention steering committee, where it's crisis intervention representatives from each agency plus the hospital. They've all created themselves. There's no cost to that. They just go to a meeting and they talk about the problems that we're facing, sometimes these frequent utilizers. But to get to the data and get them to actually tell you, they're not telling you the name of the person. They're not telling you any identification of who's what. But like I said, with my numbers, I know I said, here's 47 people that have been to my jail five or more times, our jail, I should say. And they come back and they say, you know, 58% of those folks have been admitted to our emergency department. And they gave us a chart as to uh, an admission or emergency room treatment and release type things. And I think that's very telling for them to realize that while they're not looking at the booking intakes, we're not privy to or looking at the emergency rooms. But when you find that they're both clients of the substance abuse and or behavioral health uh, providers in the community, frequent and high utilizers of the emergency department at the hospitals and frequent uh, bookie uh, detainees at the county jail, that's a lot of money and resources being spent that if we get together and come up with some positive solution, uh, we can help save us all and better serve the people that we represent. Thank you very much, Alan. There is a, some information in the chat box um, that I'm just going to uh, read through. Um, here in this last couple minutes that we have. And um, hopefully the person um, who provided this information, uh, can, we can follow up with you to get some information um, specifically related to this. So there was a time in the 1990s that systems, DCFS, uh, Department of Children and Family Services, and the D Division of Mental Health merged to address child abuse, neglect, and mental health issues in the community level. We had C and A. L-A-N-S, and apologize, I do not know exactly what those acronyms stand for, uh, but they were designated for every community in Illinois that were tapped to conduct processes very similar to what you have described and to provide wraparound services to children to divert them from the system and step those who are institutionalized back into the community. This was a somewhat systematic effort that was proven to reduce the cost of serving high-risk children and the families member family-centered services, and prevent them from cycling or falling through the cracks of multiple services. Is there a way that this effort could be more systematically rolled out and evaluated for accountability by implementing a framework um, that is similar to one that occurred for the CNA LANS? Um, I, this is great information that, like I said, um, I'm hoping that uh, we can uh, continue this conversation and review some of the amazing best practices that have happened in the past. I think uh, one thing with the sequential intercept model, it's a very simple tool for a complex system, but if there's one thing um, that I, I see with it is that simple tools uh, bring us back to some of the same uh, issues that we've been dealing with over and over again. And 
not to reinvent the wheel. We should be looking at those past um, services that perhaps were defunded in the past or um, otherwise uh, were not continued and look and see what we can learn from them. So we're hoping that this conversation, this larger Illinois data-driven health and justice conversation uh, can continue with a, a broad variety of stakeholders so that we can leverage the good ideas in the past and also harness the latest technology and research that's out there uh, to, make, uh, to make really impressive strides um, here as part of the national initiative. Oh, thank you. Uh, child and adult local area networks. That's what the CNA LANS. So we will look that up and uh, bring that in. There was one more question. What are suggestions for those who are not ready for treatment and who remain frequent system utilizers? I'm not sure, do, um, Michelle, do you have any anything that you can add on that? I, I know that um, I've been privy to the conversations regarding our CP utilizers in the county I reside in. And um, it is a very difficult population. And I think that you need to hopefully come up with some creative solutions. Um, there are some that exist around the country. We do know that some super utilizers don't fit into the molds that we don't want, that we want to put them into, um, like such as um, becoming um, free of drug, drugs and alcohol. Um, some people aren't ready for that. And so looking at uh, different options and how to work with them. Um, and we know that, though, that if we can provide affordable housing or free housing and just medical support, people um, tend to get better and they come in contact with our first responders much less often. So it may not be the end result that we want, but it's something that, that can help. I don't know if that helps or not, but... Thank you. We'll certainly keep this conversation going. Please, again, um, acknowledge that uh, we have some amazing resources locally in terms of Michelle and Alan. Um, we also have the website, um, cja.state.il.us.ddhj. And please uh, keep checking into the website as we'll be uploading resources here. We'll also be uploading the taping, the recording of this webinar and subsequent webinars that we are planning in this series on the website. This particular recording should be available before the end of the week on the website. And we want to thank everybody for your time today and look forward to working with you in this very worthy endeavor. Thank you.